I got the arm up and the thumbs up, so that means it's one o'clock and time to start. So thank you everybody for coming out. Thank you everybody for tuning in at home. Today is all about signs of spring. I know, according to the calendar, it's not spring, but tell Mother Nature. I think she's been thinking it's spring since January when we had a 70, 60 degree day. Just like today outside, it's about 58. I don't think it went below freezing last night either. So I'm gonna take you through birds and plants and trees that tell us spring is here. You know, there was a time when it was the robin who told us that spring was here. You know, all of a sudden, at some point in March, you would see a robin and you hadn't seen them all winter long. Well, that's not true anymore. In the winter time, yes, robins used to migrate, but why migrate when you can find food around here? And so robins kind of change their diet in the winter time, from eating those worms to eating seeds and berries. You can see them eating the berries on the tree here, the sumac, staghorn sumac berries they love. I know the robins in my yard are loving eating the holly berries, okay? Winterberry hollies. My robins even love the mealworms that I put out for the other birds. Hey. It beats flying 2,000 miles down to South America because during migration, well, not every bird survives flying migration in one way or the other. The thing that really is becoming the sign of spring, if we think about the robins, it's when you see the flock become pairs. So as they start pairing off, as they start chasing the other ones away, as they start singing more and courting more, that's when you know it's spring or that's a sign of spring for us. They not only get territorial with each other, they will get territorial with the other birds also. So in my yard, the robin and the mockingbird have been territorial all winter because they both like the holly tree. So it's fun to watch them chase each other out and then they all kind of sneak past each other and go in and find some food. Well, related to the robin, a bird who has never been a migratory species, the bluebird. Bluebirds never migrated. Okay, occasionally we would get some from New York, New England, who would come down here to visit because you know they still get snow up there, <laughs> even this year especially. But the bluebirds stick around. Bluebirds also, you will see flocks of them, oftentimes huddling together in the boxes that they're gonna nest in. Oftentimes just hanging out. I love the winter. I'll have two dozen in my backyard. You know, and if you, did this one have it? Yes. A bluebird with a little bit of snow on the ground is definitely one of the most beautiful things to see. Wait, and I haven't seen that in my backyard all winter. Because <laughs> there has been no white stuff in my backyard all winter long. But the bluebirds have been there. You know, they know that this girl puts out those mealworms for them. Yeah, I'm looking for the sound of the, here it is. And they're singing already out there. Not only are they singing, they're sitting on top of the boxes, getting ready to nest. Okay, you have the brighter colored male over here, and then the more dull slate blue, lighter chest. If you notice, they look similar to robins. Well, they're related to robins. 
Bluebirds and robins are in the same family called thrushes. Okay? That's why their sound is both very musical, their colors are similar, they eat similar things. The bluebirds will also eat the berries, the mealworms. I even catch my bluebirds in the wintertime eating the suet. Every bird needs that extra fat from the suet, whether it's vegetable shortening or beef fat, they'll eat that also. The peanut butter, they need that. So now they're getting ready to claim those boxes and they're also pairing off individually. One of the other signs, of course, of spring, which would have been last month, Well, tell that to the groundhogs that live in the county park, because even in January, I saw them. Did you? Oh, they didn't hibernate this year. Okay, they took a rest. <laughs> they took a rest, and then they poked out of that hole because it has been so warm this winter, and they can find the food. Just like the birds migrate to find food, groundhogs hibernate, well, because there's not much food in my garden for them you know, or anywhere else out in the grass. So they're gonna hibernate. This year, they came out, like I said, I saw them in January roaming around, and they were finding food, okay? So for me, a real true sign of spring in most years, because we go from cold at night, cold in the day, to cold at night, and warm in the day, maple sugaring, okay? We could have been tapping the trees all winter long. No, that wouldn't work because the trees really need that cold. So now is the actual, what should be the sugaring season when we have alternating night, cold at night, warm in the day. And we're doing it out at the county park. We have to. We're here for education, not for making syrup. So, and that's a good thing this year. Um, there's not gonna be a lot of syrup made in the state of Pennsylvania with our temperatures that are really not alternating right now. And the trees are starting to put their leaves out, which is typically the end of the sugaring season. So this Sunday, from one to four, we will be out at the county park, making our syrup, where you can stop by at any time between one and four. It's a free program. You can see us teaching people about boiling the syrup, tapping the trees. And if you stop out between one and four, you can go to all the different stations, but you'll definitely wanna make sure you get to the last station in the tour because that's the candy station. That's where I'll be. <laughs> Last Sunday, when it was extra warm, we had over 600 people there. Lisa stood at the stove making candy from 12.45 to 3.45. Okay, I walked this way and I walked that way. And finally at 3.45, I walked out from behind the stove, <laughs> took a few steps, and then came right back because more people were coming. So at that event, like I said, it's free. You can just drop by, walk around for a half hour or an hour with the tour, or you can just stop by and buy Pennsylvania maple syrup from our vendor who comes from Tioga County at Patterson Farms. So this is the last public day this year until next year, the last weekend in February and the first weekend in March. That's typically when we have our alternating cold nights, warm days, that's why we do it then. But we'll make it look like we have lots of sap out there. There will be stuff cooking over the fire. So maple sugaring, a true sign of spring. Another true sign, and this has already happened, because owls will lay their eggs in January. And the baby owlets by the end of February and mid-March are hatching. So here we have the great horned owl, our classic hoo 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 hoo, the cl 
Classic Houdal. Nice and camouflaged. Great. Feather tufts on the top of their head. And those baby owlets will be in that nest for a good two months. So right now is the time of the year where mom and dad are extra busy at nighttime out there looking for food for the young. If it's not a great horned owl going hoo 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 hoo. I was like, what happened to the picture? Could be our dark-eyed owl, who is the barred owl for the bars and the stripes. And they're the ones who say, <laughs> that's who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. <laughs> that's the barred owl, because I know you know, now's not the time of the year you want to open up your windows late at night, although I'd like to, because I want to make sure I'm not missing out on any of those nighttime sounds. You might want to listen for those owls as they celebrate the birth of their owlets at this time of the year. And our smallest owl is the screech owl, the one who says, and scientists say the screech owl makes those two different sounds. The first one they refer to as the whinny, and the second one is the tremolo. And you'll hear both of those sounds. Screech owls are the owl species who likes to live in boxes. So a little bit bigger than the box you might put out for a bluebird, a three inch entrance hole, and a little higher up. A bluebird box is good at about five feet off of the ground. The owls like to be about 12 feet off of the ground, okay? None of these three owl species throughout the winter, whoops, wrong way. None of these owl species throughout the winter would have been building their nest. Owls don't carry sticks and build nests. Because the owl lays its eggs in early January or late January, depending, they just take a nest that a hawk built. And that's the advantage of being the first bird species to lay your eggs. You get the easy way out. You let the hawk do the building the year before, and before the hawk comes back in April to lay their eggs, well, now the owl lives there. And that's all right, the hawk will just go build a new nest. And the owl will use that nest that the hawk built for a couple of years until it starts to fall down, and then they'll go find a more recent nest that the hawk built. Or they will find, if it's not a box, a cavity a hole in a tree. Again, they don't have to build that. A branch fell off the tree to create the cavity. Or maybe a woodpecker lived in a hole in the tree for one season and then the owl will move in. Now in January and February, you will see this bird carry sticks to their nest, the bald eagles. And around here, bald eagles typically lay their eggs the last week of February, the first week or two of March. Hey, that's where we are right now. So they should have been or are laying their eggs, okay? A couple of local nests. If you were to drive by a local nest, you'll know that an egg has been laid because there will be either the male or the female always sitting in the nest once the egg is laid. And like the owls, the eagles will lay one, two, three eggs. Owls could lay four or five even. Eagles typically stop at around three, okay? But when they lay their eggs, they might just like the owls, the eagle will lay one egg maybe on Monday, and she might not lay a second egg till Wednesday. She might not lay the third egg then until Friday. 
And for that reason, they will actually hatch on different days. So inside a bird of prey nest, eagles, owls, hawks, you will have a young one who has a sibling that might be three days or even a whole week older than you are in that nest. And survival of the fittest in competition for food begins the day you're born because you're going to have a sibling there that you want to make sure you get lots of food. Whereas that robin and that bluebird, when they start nesting, which, you know, they're toying with it right now. I hope they hold off in case we do get some cold. But once the songbirds start building nests and laying eggs, they lay one egg a day until all five eggs are laid and they sit on them and keep them warm and they all hatch on the same day. So in the songbird nest, all the babies hatch on the same day and they don't have to compete for food in the same way the eagles and the owls compete for food. Let me play the sound of the bald eagle in case you're ever out there close to one of the nests and I know there's a couple in this area because the eagle does not make a ferocious sound like we think it should. Where's my bald eagle? Here we go. I think they sound more like a seagull. Okay. Well, they're a fish-eating bird, so it kind of makes sense that they sound a little bit like a seagull. But oftentimes people will think this sound is an eagle. Let me play this high-pitched. That's not the sound of an eagle. That's a red-tailed hawk. But I understand why people often think that that is the bald eagle. Because this has happened to me. I've been watching a movie or a show, and an eagle flies overhead. And on the TV, they play the sound of the red-tailed hawk. Because we expect that bald eagle to be a little bit more eerie, a little bit more ferocious. That's typically when I turn that show off. Because if they got the sound of the bald eagle wrong, what else is wrong in that show? I have found that only the shows that are all about Alaska do they get the correct sound of the bald eagle. And when that flies overhead, you hear the right sound. Well, this next sound, I'm going to play it actually before I switch. And we'll see if any of you this year have already heard and seen these flocks fly overhead because this bird <laughs> came a month early. It was really interesting. I got back in, it was January, it was the end of January. I got two, three, Three text messages on a Saturday, Sunday from different friends. There's a million snow geese in Centerville. And I don't know why all my friends were in Centerville that weekend, but whatever. Um, and that's where all those snow geese were. And normally the snow geese don't show up here until the end of February. And they all like to go to Middle Creek. This year they have been in every open field. Have you all seen any right around here? Over in Lampeter on Lampeter Road, that pond, that field, they've been all over. They've been everywhere because, well, everywhere the ground is thawed. Little blades of grass are coming up already. That's what they're looking for, and the value of the pond is the water source. So they don't have to go to Middle Creek. 
where the reason they like Middle Creek is the lake doesn't always freeze over and there's all those little shoots of plants coming up. I read in the paper that um, Middle Creek has peaked already. There are less snow geese up at Middle Creek this year than there have been in a long time. And part of that is because they're all spread out. That weekend that several people sent me a message saying the snow geese are here. It was a couple of days after tornadoes down south. So the weather, we have to think about the weather down in the south that could have pushed them north faster. And then when they started coming further north, realizing, oh, look at all this fresh grass we can eat. We're staying, you know? And so now, who knows? They, you know, give it, if we do get some snow, and yes, this girl is still waiting for two feet, I would like at least one snowstorm this year, just, it would be nice and it would be beautiful. And, and I have to wish for two feet so that hopefully I get one foot or just a little bit, I'll take right now. So, so don't everybody rush up to Middle Creek because it, now there's some there. So if you want to go, go and take a look because there's nothing better than hearing the snow geese, or seeing them rise and fall. And if we don't get the real white flakes, it's fun to see the white birds reproduce that. Um, always, this next bird comes at the end of February. The red-winged blackbird, it is always a sign that will be maple sugaring in the sugar bush, and all of a sudden you'll hear. The red winged blackbird. They're back already. The red winged blackbird I wanted to check just two weeks ago. I was like, are there any red winged blackbirds? They like to be around water. They love their cattails to nest on. So I went over to an area in the park where I know they always nest and I hadn't seen any, but I played that sound. And I saw three males right away. <laughs> oh, because they, you make that sound of the red winged blackbird. And of course that's the male. That's the female. She's all camouflaged. I did not see a female. And oftentimes in the bird world, the males come first. And then a couple days later, the females will show up. Okay? They may, the females may have already been there. I just didn't see any. I played that sound of the male, and whoop, three males popped up and put their wings out. You know, I was the intruder. And they were trying to tell me to get out of their wetland, you know. They probably, because birds do this, they return to the same place they nested the year before, or they might have been born there last year. And now they're coming to raise their own young there. So the red-winged blackbirds, always a good sign. I'm sure in the wetland here, you all have them out there. Anyone see or hear any yet this year? Have you? Um, so yeah, that's good that they are here also. Now in the next couple of weeks, we will get another bird of prey who will start nesting. And this is probably one of my favorite birds of prey and my favorite story about a spring nesting bird. This is the peregrine falcon. The peregrine falcon who was actually, back in the 1940s, extirpated, not extinct, but none of them lived in Pennsylvania. And that's what extirpated means. It means they are extinct in one area. There were still peregrine falcons out in the Midwest, but not in the state of Pennsylvania. And around 1991, a pair came to Harrisburg and they nested on the ledge of the building. See, typically they nest in ledges of rocky outcrop areas. We now have several pairs that nest year after year under bridges. But this pair is my favorite. 
because they chose a special building in Harrisburg, the building where the office of the Department of Environmental Protection is. They knew exactly where to go. That building is also called the Rachel Carson Building. And of course, Rachel Carson is the one that in 1963 wrote Silent Spring, telling us how we were killing not only peregrine falcons, but the bald eagles and every other bird by using DDT and other chemicals and stuff. And the problem back in the 60s when there were no peregrine falcons here, the ones that were migrating were going down to South America where they were still using those horrible chemicals and so they were unable to reproduce. Well, there is a webcam that you can look at and you can watch from the time those eggs are laid here in March till they hatch in April. You can watch as they develop and grow up and stuff. It's a great webcam. They now have, I think, four or five webcams on the same pair. So you can watch from every different angle of it from far away and closer together. So the peregrine falcon is one of those wonderful success stories of us cleaning up the environment and them being able to survive. I forget, a few years ago, someone from the Game Commission had told me that they were aware of about 11 peregrine falcon nests on rocky outcrops. So really getting back to their roots, getting back to where they should be nesting. But hey, buildings and bridges make a great place also. What we think about birds, we have to think about a few waterfowl, like the prettiest duck who does still migrate you know, you'll see mallards all winter long. We'll see some mergansers who come here just in the winter time. But soon we will see the wood ducks return. Oops, that's not a wood duck. I clearly, this is a woodcock. That's the beep, beep of the woodcock. Clearly she didn't put her glasses on to hit the wood duck that's right above the woodcock. There's the wood duck. Not a quack quack, but a high pitch kind of call. Wood ducks are our duck who must also live in a cavity, a hole, either in a tree or in a box. Let me ask, do you all have any wood ducks boxes in your little wetland area? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Soon you might. OK. That's good. And they will also use natural cavities, too. Okay. So they might nest in your box. Don't be disappointed if none of them nest there. Hopefully that means they are finding those natural cavities. So wood duck soon. Blooming right now. How many of you have seen flowers recently? If you walk in this building, there's some beautiful crocuses out there in the flower beds. Let's take a look at the very first wild one to come up. Skunk cabbage. Okay. Some of you and a lot of people are more familiar with the greens of skunk cabbage because that's what you'll see all summer long. Here in February, this is the actual flower. So that's the hood, okay? One reason skunk cabbage can bloom, and it can bloom when there's snow on the ground, is that deep inside where the flower is, it could be 85 degrees. If there's snow around that skunk cabbage, it'll melt the snow. And yes, it does smell like a skunk inside. Actually, I find and think that it smells more like a rotting animal, more like death. Um, but that's because beetles love that smell. And beetles are the ones who crawl in to pollinate the skunk cabbage. But if you don't see the skunk cabbage in February, 
by the time March rolls around, this beautiful purple flower goes back down into the ground. And as it goes down into the ground, up comes the green leaves. And that's why most people in the summertime think skunk cabbage is just the green leaves. Even though it has the word cabbage in it, it is not edible. It is poisonous. Okay, the plant is kind of telling you it's poisonous by the way it smells. Okay, if it smells like rotting animals, don't eat it, you know? And, and I'm the girl who eats anything in the wild, and I'm giving you a good advice there not to eat the stuff that smells like rotting animals, okay? In our flower beds, even along the river, because they used to be in people's flower beds, you will find snowdrops. Even snowdrops are a month early this year. Okay? I actually went back and looked on my phone. Okay, so I should probably now throw in this year's picture. So this is a picture from last two years ago, sorry, that I took at home. Here it is two years ago, and I looked on my phone the other day, and it was dated March 27th. My yard looks like that last Friday. The crocuses are up. And now, luckily, I have more snowdrops because they like to spread out. But the snowdrops have been blooming for over a month already. OK? So the snowdrops are and not only snowdrops, but winter aconites. They are the, they've also been blooming over a month now. When they started blooming back in early January, I knew winter was coming to an end, or never even getting started this year. So fields of snowdrops and aconites along the rivers and in people's yards. I drove by someone's house just last week, and their whole front lawn was snowdrops. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. Um, and then there are, so snowdrops and aconites are actually domestic bulbs that people have planted, kind of like tulips and crocuses. And they've kind of naturalized during floods, and that's why oftentimes you'll see them along the river and stuff. They washed out of someone's yard in a flood, and now they're deposited along the stream bank. And I'm not mad about that. They're not invasive. They're not taking over the world. And they only bloom for a few weeks here at the end of winter. And two weeks ago, on all the aconites in front of my office, there were mason bees and honeybees. So we got warm enough for them to wake up they need flowers. And so those snowdrops, aconites, veronicas, these are the tiny little uh, periwinkle color down in the grass. They're hidden, but they're blooming already. Last Thursday afternoon, I would go to the after school program at Lafayette every Thursday afternoon. And I had the kids out there because it was what was it, 70 degrees last Thursday? So we went outside, gave them magnifying glasses, challenged them to find different colored flowers. That was one of our activities. Yes, they found Veronica's and Speedwell's. They found several other things. A couple dandelions were blooming. Also, some ground ivy, a little, another purple flower was blooming. You know, this is when our daffodils should look like this right now. They're all up already, just like the crocuses. So here's daffodil spikes coming up out of the ground. And any day, because those spikes that are coming out of the ground, I can see unopened flower buds, okay? Any day now, they will be blooming. Yep. And typically, it's not until mid-April for daffodils, okay? So again, just a little early. Even these little guys came out early this year. The ground thawed out, just like the groundhog came out early. The spring peepers 
came out early. Where's my... So, of course, our frogs and toads, they're hibernators. They go down into that mud. They hibernate. As that mud thaws out, they'll come out of the ground. Usually, peepers don't start peeping until around the second week in March. Okay? Nope. Again, a month early for the peepers. And even wood frogs. Okay? See, frogs and peepers have antifreeze-like in their body, which allows them to freeze and thaw out. The spring peeper, the one who wears a mask, or I'm sorry, the wood frog, the one who wears a mask, um, they're already out there croaking. Okay? Later on, I'll mention the American toad, because they're supposed to wait until April to start doing their sounds. I'm afraid any day now the toads will also be out. More wildflowers. Uh, most of our spring wildflowers, like this one, bitter cress. It's flowering already. It's an edible wild flower. It's a mustard. So you can actually eat the greens, you can eat the seeds on bitter cress. Just like I know out there, I haven't found any yet because I haven't gone looking. Winter cress. So winter cress, right now you'll see those greens. And you might recognize that green from, well, the salad bar. Okay? It's actually a green that is grown and put in those bagged salads with spinach and stuff. It's the one that will be the yellow wildflower blooming along the edge of the roads. Winter cress, it's a mustard. Field mustards, black mustards. I'm sure we'll see them soon, just like my favorite, chickweed. Hey, chickweed's been lush and green all winter. That's been one of the advantages of not having a lot of snow. I've been able to eat the bittercress and the chickweed in my garden all winter because it can handle the cold. You know, having these warm days, I'm the one who's so tempted to plant my spinach and kale and everything. Yeah, I did put some seeds out a couple weeks ago. They're sprouting. I'm going to get my peas out any day now because i got to get them out before March 17th, before St. Patrick's Day. And they can tolerate the cold, just like the chickweed and the bittercress. They can tolerate the cold. I'm definitely not tempted to put my tomato seeds out, though. Okay? I'm not even tempted to start them inside yet because anyone know when our last frost typically is? Yeah, mid-May nowadays. I think it was May of 2020 that we had our latest frost, which was around May 18th. So you can't put those tomatoes and peppers and stuff out until after that. This year, it'll be interesting to see when our last frost is. Since we didn't have many frost days, I'm hopeful for that. Yeah, I'd be hopeful. Or will it be June? You know? <laughs> I'll bite my tongue. I didn't say that. Hepatica is one of the first woodland wildflowers. Now, our spring ephemerals, our spring wildflowers, are in the woodlands. So hepatica is going to start blooming real soon because the woods, in typically the end of March and April, are warmer than the fields and meadows because there's no leaves on those trees. And so our woodlands, with the decay of the leaves, will warm up quicker, and our plants like hepatica will start blooming. Okay? Out in fields, well, how many lawns have onion grass everywhere? And that's about the only thing growing in those lawns. Of course, those long, skinny greens are the onion grass. They're edible. 
you know, free onions and the lawn everywhere, they will eventually get a flower, a little purple flower. But most of them don't ever get a chance to get that purple flower because I know the lawn mowers are coming out soon. You know, I was actually the other day when it was, or Thursday, when it was 70 degrees, I was surprised the guy across the road and up a ways didn't have his lawnmower going. Because I was kind of thinking he might, you know. Um, I'll wait. A non-native invasive, celandine. You can see all that yellow. I have seen the green leaves already. Right out there in amongst the grass are these waxy, shiny leaves. I know that means the celandine flowers are coming. And growing all winter long, another one I was happy to have in my garden and in the edges of woods, stinging nettle. Ah, yes, it stings, yes, it hurts. But it's delicious. And it's been growing all winter long. Again, it's a wildflower. It can tolerate the cold. And I love picking it, boiling it, eating it like spinach, or making tea out of the stinging nettle. You know, you got to find that appreciation for the thing that most people don't like. Okay? And I try to do that when it comes to plants and uh, some animals. But stinging nettle I love and... Oh, yeah. You know, they're starting to flower. So if you're someone who likes to eat the leaves of dandelions, you better start now. Because you want to eat the green leaves before the flower blooms. And I was out walking around this morning in the field in the park, and I came across six dandelions. So, yep, our fields are going to be covered. Usually, it's the end of April, okay? Around Earth Day, April 22nd. They're going to be a lot earlier this year, so get out and gather those dandelion greens and make some hot bacon dressing to go with them. Because if you do that, then I know you're definitely a true Lancastrian. Because that's, we take our spinach greens and our dandelion greens and we add that wonderful hot bacon dressing. And while you look down on the ground for those dandelions and the greens, don't forget to look up at the trees. So when I mentioned earlier about maple sugaring and making that maple syrup, the maple trees are starting to leaf out and put out their flowers. My silver maples have flowers, full-on flowers like that. Actually, that's a silver maple. Full-on flowers. Here's the buds. And the, when the wind blows, I mean, I can look up and see those flower buds up in my silver maples. But when the wind blows, I can see them down on the ground now, too. The unfortunate thing is there might not be many seeds this year. So the other day I was like, well, I'm not sad about that in my yard. Because those seeds then, I just pull little tiny silver maples out of my garden and my flower beds. But the birds need those seeds to eat. But more importantly, I'm more afraid of when the orchards start flowering. There are ornamental cherry trees flowering right now, okay? When Cherry Hill Orchard flowers this week, next week, and then we do get a cold spell, we won't have fruit this winter. That's the scary thing when it comes to trees flowering too early. Um, the cherry blossoms in D.C. typically bloom around April 5th was last week or the week before that Al Roker early in the morning said the peak is going to be March 5th. Today they adjusted that this morning. I heard on the Today Show first thing um, that now the peak should be around March 15th to the 20th in that area. It's still early. 
And they also followed that up with, well, we're not quite sure because if we get two days of 70 again, that's going to speed that peak up again. Okay? Having multiple days of 60, 70 degree weather is what's causing those trees to open. Friends, a friend told me a couple weeks ago that all the forsythia in their development was blooming. Okay? We have a forsythia outside of my office. I looked at it this morning and the buds, you can see the yellow. Can't see the actual flower yet, but it's coming. You know, just like it was this morning when I was driving through the city that I was like, cherry trees everywhere in the city are blooming. Okay, so a few concerns. This one though, the oak trees, they haven't started blooming yet. I'll let you know when I start sneezing. Okay, so the oak tree, if you notice, does not have a pretty flower. So it relies on the wind to spread the pollen. This is all the pollen, the catkins. So when the wind blows, the oak pollen goes to the other trees in order to make the acorns. Okay, pine trees also rely on the wind. Here's the white pine tree in order to make those pine cones. And that's when I will really start sneezing. Anyone who has allergies, once the pine trees and the oak trees start spreading their pollen, we sneeze. The other trees with flowers, they rely on the insects. Okay? So the lilac typically should wait until late April, Easter, right? That's when the lilacs bloom. The same with the red buds. Now, I haven't noticed any red buds opening yet, but I'm sure they will also be early. The red buds, the end of April, you're going to see those beautiful purple flowers there. Just like locust trees. It'll be late April that you'll see the flowers dangling from those trees. The leaves will be real small when all these flowers start, or all these trees start getting their flowers. Now, one of the animals who will return at the end of April, the smallest and mightiest bird, the hummingbird, loves the locust flowers, loves the redbud flowers, and even the tulip poplars. The tulip poplar, of course, is a tree. You notice how the flower looks like a tulip, okay? Thinking of tulips, I saw tulips sprouting last week also. And they typically come after the daffodils. They're already coming up too. And here's our toad. The American toad. The brown warty one. We'll know as soon as it's warm enough and it rains. They also like to wait till under the full moon. You know, they can see each other better when it's the full moon and we've gotten a little bit of a rain. Our other frogs, like the bullfrog and the green frog, well, they're going to wait till summer. They want the water to be warmer. Eh? Toads. Peepers, wood frogs, their eggs can handle the cold water, which is why they're out in the springtime, even when there's a little snow on the ground. Okay, I'm going to warn you all about the next one, because I know some of you are going to go like this. So go like this. That's right, it's going to be a snake. <laughs> or two or three. It is the garter snake. The garter snake is the last snake to go into hibernation and the first one to come out. There have been years I've seen garter snakes in January. But what really indicates spring, those of you who don't want to look, don't look at the next one because there's going to be lots of garter snakes together. They come out in groups. So. Right now, they could be hibernating down in that groundhog den. 
So in the groundhog den, you'll have the groundhogs hibernating over here and the snakes hibernating over here. And it's okay, they don't eat each other. And if you're the snake, hey, let the groundhog dig the hole for you. Since you don't have arms and can't do that, and you hibernate down there with the groundhog, well, when spring comes and they come out of hibernation, it's mating season. That's a mating ball. I have seen this twice in the wild, and actually before you see it, you hear it. Because it's spring. There's not a lot of other animals around, and you'll hear leaves rustling. And you'll look around, and there's no other humans. And you look down on the ground, and there's a mass of garter snakes. So it only lasts for a couple of weeks. And then the rest of the year, we only see them by themselves. And they're harmless to us. They're not venomous. Okay? They're actually the snake that's good in our yards because they help control the rodent population. And they stay hidden. Okay? Because they want to stay safe. Just last week, I did see my first little brown snake. Actually, it was two weeks ago, I take that back, and it was at Lafayette Elementary School with those kids, I found one. So I had them out the last two weeks because it was nice Thursday afternoons. I went over to the rock wall area, and there was a little brown snake. It was easy to catch because it was still a little cold, you know, not totally warmed up. Um, so they're out there being active. February, mid-February is mating season for lots of anim mammals. You might notice a few on the road dead at this time of the year. Yeah, because skunks do crazy stuff during mating season. Crossing the road when they shouldn't. Spraying, well that's the male spraying because that attracts the females, however that works, you know. Um, Mid-February is always mating season for skunks and this guy, raccoons, okay? So we have mating season mid-February and then it takes about three months for the young to be born and we're well into spring when that happens. And those raccoons just love climbing trees. You know, it's always a good place to look up for the raccoons up in the trees. Good thing the skunks haven't figured that trick out yet. They'll stay down low to the ground. And the foxes are also getting ready to mate right now. None of these mammals hibernate. They've all been active all winter long. Spring is now in the air, it's mating season, and then we will see the cubs, the fox cubs, whether it's a red fox or even gray fox cubs. They're gonna stay in that den until later in June when they make their way out and they begin to learn how to hunt. And in the next, well, I was gonna say in the next couple of weeks, but it could be happening right now, more migratory birds coming back. The ones that come back in flocks, like tree swallows. Tree swallows are the other blue colored bird who likes to nest in the bluebird boxes. So we get a pair of tree swallows right outside of my office, and I haven't seen them yet, because they always perch on the box right outside of the office, but I expect them any day now. When the tree swallows come, the barn swallows will come. But when they come, then we know the insects are out. And I'm not ready for the mosquitoes yet. I feel like the mosquitoes just stopped biting me, <laughs> and now they're all gonna come out which is why tree swallows, barn swallows, still fully migrate. They all leave the area because they are true insect eaters. They don't change their diet like those robins did. Neither does the house wren. She is still an insect eater, so she's been gone all winter long. Just like the tree swallow, the house swallow, or the tree swallow and the house wren, they will nest in the bluebird boxes. 
And then by the time late April rolls around, most of our migratory birds are back, except this is the last one always to return. One who sounds like a flute, the wood thrush. And if you recognize the name wood thrush, remember the robin and the bluebird were in the thrush family. They are related, but wood thrushes still migrate. And by the time they come back late April, first week of May, I might be out there with a school field trip. And you know, I might have a bunch of third graders with me in the woods and all of a sudden, I'll hear one. It doesn't matter if we're learning about trees, birds, wildflowers, everything stops. And I make those kids listen to the wood thrush sound. And then I play the sound because to me, the wood thrush kind of indicates that all the birds are back by now, okay? Because by April 15th, this next bird is back. The hummingbird. It'll also be interesting to see if our ruby-throated hummingbird who typically comes back around April 15th, April 22nd. And I say the 15th first because the 15th is the day well, you do your taxes in the morning and you put your hummingbird feeder out in the afternoon. And then you're ready for when the ruby-throated hummingbird comes back around April 22nd. And that's when then we know all the birds have returned. So should probably wash up that feeder and get it ready because <laughs> I feel like they're going to be here before we know it. And if we go further than into April, May, our last animal to be born will be the fawns. And when the fawns are finally born at the end of May, well, now we're getting ready for our next season, <laughs> summer. I want to have a nice long spring. I don't want to go right into 90 degree days in the summertime. If we didn't get a winter, I hope we have a cooler summer. Although some are saying, no, having a warm winter means we're going to have a hot summer. Yeah, I'd rather not. So hopefully we do get a chance to experience some nice spring weather. Hopefully all those trees that begin flowering will have a chance to make their fruit. And even though I'm wishing for a foot of snow, I'm kind of not. Because once everything starts budding and opening, I want everything to be able to survive. So as you take a walk around the building, as you drive down the roads, Notice all those wonderful signs of spring looking down towards the ground, up to the trees and up to the skies. Because I expect we should see some of those snow geese still flying above us for a couple weeks. They can't go to New England because they actually got snow this week. So <laughs> hopefully they're tuning in to the meteorologists to know to stay put here in Lancaster County where there's no snow coming for a while, unfortunately. Anyone have any questions about our signs of spring, what to expect? April 15th. Yep, mid-April. You know, there was a couple of years ago where I guess I must have been slacking off at the park and I didn't have the hummingbird feeder out and I came to work that one morning at the end of April and sitting on the branch of the tree where the feeder was the year before was the male hummingbird. <laughs> he looked at me like, 1,500 miles I flew. Where's my sugar water? <laughs> I went inside, mixed up some sugar water, one part water to a quarter cup of sugar, and put that feeder right out for him. Oh, ma'am, that's a good 
question. You know, I was looking in my strawberry patch and the leaves are, I feel like they're growing. Yep, I feel like they are growing. You know, in the winter, they kind of shrink up. I feel like they're, yep. I don't know, because I usually, you know, strawberries are around Memorial Day, sometimes early May uh, or mid-May kind of thing. I wouldn't be sad if they came early. You know, Floridas are in season. Right now, I'm afraid of the strawberries in California could have a little snow on them right now. Yep. Lancaster County Central Park. Central Park. We are right outside of Lancaster City. Um, if you're in the city, coming out Prince Street or Duke Street towards Willow Street, towards Kendig Square Shopping Center. Um, LancasterCountyParks.org is our web page, and you can find an actual address. And if you want to come to Maple Sugaring, just come to any entrance of the park, and I have signs up. With arrows, maple sugaring, turn here. And that will take you right to the pavilion. You're welcome. A lot of people come out to maple sugaring every year. They've come for years and years because it's what you do in the end of the winter. You know, it's just a good spring outing. Last weekend, you know, having over 600 people there, there were people just out in the park walking or walking their dog or driving through because it was a beautiful day, and they ended up at Sugaring because we were there doing it, and why not? Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out. i see you all next month. And happy spring.